online when you're obviously um, connecting um, and obviously making sure that you have access to that port when it's talking to the ZVM server. Um, default administrator password. This uh, is, is password, so recommend you change that when you install, install them. Um, so there's actually a guide, and these slides are going to be available afterwards. Um, but there's a guide we have online that can uh, talk you through where, to, where that needs to be changed. But again, a big one, that's obviously a, a, a security flaw. If, if you leave that as password, you, you're going to want to change that. Um, <coughs> we obviously have, again, documentation. This is all available via MyZerto, so tech documentation, and that's online as well as downloadable form. Um, and Heiz has obviously talked about our... Uh, uh, new GitHub page where we, we, ha we had a couple previously, we've merged them all into one. Long term goal is obviously to actually, I don't know if you guys have seen the API white paper we have, um, loads of example scripts in it. Long term goal is to remove that and pull the scripts out and uh, obviously put them all on the GitHub page. It's much easier for us to maintain and much easier for you to uh, access the code without copying and pasting out of white paper documents, right? Um, so there's templates on there, recommend that you, you obviously um, uh, s start there, that's always a good place to start, there's no point in reinventing the wheel with a lot of this stuff. Um, so when you're using the, the command lets, you obviously have to add the snap in, um, step one, um, and also uh, set the ex execution policy to remote sign force, um, otherwise uh, you're going to get errors when you run the, the script. Um, we, we, the biggest thing with this, and you, you know, those of you that are already utilizing APIs and commandlets are going to know is, you know, you're going to create elements that are relevant to more than just one script, right? So make sure you're making the most out of that rather than rewriting it all the time or doing things differently. Try and keep it as consistent across all of them, makes it much more manageable. <clears throat> so as an example, obviously add the snap in. Commandlets are much easier than the API in that you've got a specific command that's going to give you a pretty specific outcome. With the API, you get a lot of information out there. Maybe that's not relevant to what you're doing and you have to narrow it down. Commandlets, you can run, run the, uh, uh, the, the command a lot more direct. Um, you don't have to um, have a lot of the complex um, engagements that you have with the API side of things. So this one here is just getting protection groups. So you can see some of the information you can get out um, out of this. Um, again, uh, if we look at REST API editors, this is going to be a bit broader than just Windows. Um, so you've got your usual. Um, I actually um, utilize PowerShell for most of the REST API scripts that we do. And actually, most of ours that we've got online are based on PowerShell. But it's up to you where you, where, you know how you want to write it, which, which uh, language you're going to use. And obviously that's going to dictate what editor you're going to use. So you've got the usual three that I obviously mentioned. If you're doing it on Linux, you've got Nano, Vim, whatever, whatever your preference is there. Um, but again, you know, this is really down to preference rather than us telling you this is the way to do it. It's uh, what suits you best. Um, prereqs for this. Um, so the key thing here is you don't need to install anything on any, any of your VMs where the scripts are running because you're, you're running it against uh, the, the ZVM itself. So obviously makes it a little bit easier from that side of things. Um, depends how you want to um, uh, utilize uh, this, as I said. But if you're using Bash, you could use curl to, to call the um, commands. As I said, most of what we've done from a template perspective is PowerShell. Um, so we're using invoke rest method, um, which is obviously built in. Um, key thing, you know, it doesn't matter what you want, what what what, what you want to choose to utilise here. You know, Google's going to have the information to provide it. I think we got some information on using it with Python as well in some of the documentation we have today. Um, but yeah, it's really down to preference and what suits your environment. You know, you might not have any Microsoft uh, elements, and therefore PowerShell is probably not going to be ideal for you. Proper authentication credentials, so it's authenticating directly against um, the ZVM server. So same, same credentials as, as you would when you're logging into it, which makes it nice and easy. Um, same port as well, so it's 9669. Um, but the key thing, you have to open a session before you can uh, call any of the API calls. Um, so you, that's uh, obviously step one in any of the scripts. And again, we've got all of that, and I think Heise is going to touch on some of that as we go through. 
Um, and again, online help, all available on my Zerto under tech documentation. Um, so that's online, and you can actually download it as well in a PDF format as, if you want. So I'm going to hand it back to Hives now. I like looking down on you from here. Yeah, my assistant likes looking down. There's a bull patch there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to specifically talk a little bit about our APIs right now. So what is available? What can you do with them? Um, but before we start, um, we also have Zerto Analytics. And um, Zerto Analytics has this API as well. So Zerto Analytics is completely API first. Um, new product, we decided to start and build it, and, and everything's based on the API. So everything you see in Zero Analytics, you can pull out of it as well using the APIs. Um, and that's typically more for the, the monitoring analytics type of uh, uh, applications. Uh, if you look at Zerto's ZVM API, that's more focused on like operational uh, orchestration, like Ansible, uh, VRO, vRealize orchestration, all these kind of things. So it's really the operation and the analytics side of it. Um, of course, you can also pull analytics or status or, or RPO um, statistics out of the ZVM. Um, but analytics, uh, one real advantage of analytics, specifically around alerting, who likes our alerting? <laughs> I'm, I'm with you. Um, but what, the, what analytics does, it actually collects from every ZVM that's reporting into it all the alerts and does deduplication and, and some other smart tricks there. So instead of pulling all the alerts from the different ZVMs and getting all kinds of double results, you can actually pull them directly from Zerto Analytics and get them deduplicated in one place. So that's what I really like about Zerto Analytics. Um, there's a couple more things we have coming up with regards to um, alerting. Some of them are based out of our hackathon we had on Sunday. Some of them are um, projects others did and are going to share on our GitHub. But it's definitely something we're working on uh, on improving. Now, a few things to know. Everything in Zerto has its own identifier. So every object has its own identifier, whether it's a data store, whether it's a VM, a VPG, you name it. And you have to use those to communicate with the API. So if I want the statistics of a specific VPG, I use the identifier of that VPG. Um, the reason we have our own identifiers is because we support multiple platforms. So we can't use the identifier of VMware because first of all, it can change um, and it's not consistent across all our APIs. So using this makes it consistent for us. So it's easier to code against. All the responses are either returned in JSON or in XML. Um, use whatever you like best. Um, and this is a quick trick for anyone that doesn't know this one. If you hold the control key on your keyboard and double click the Zerto logo in the top right of the screen, it opens up a little window where you can actually execute REST commands directly and get the results. So if you quickly want to see what the results look like, what the format is, go there, go to REST, type VPGs, enter, and you get the response you would get from our API. They've hidden that pretty well because I haven't seen it. It's, it took me a while before I found out. It was actually by accident. Uh, also has some other elements in there, but specifically about the REST, there's like a small REST client in there that allows you to quickly show the results. Now, in, uh, in Java Analytics, we actually use the Open API standard and Swagger, so that's even better. Um, we're still looking at moving to something similar for, for the ZVM as well, but because there's a lot of history, you have to create all the YAML files for Open API. It's a lot of work, um, but definitely something we're, we're looking at and working on right now. But this is like, in the meantime, you can use this one. Now, who is, what's, what's this JSON all about? Uh, uh, it's not Jason Bourne, of course, or as who here watched Team America, like Mad Damon. So that's that's him. Uh, Jason is a syntax and for storing and exchanging data. So you can actually send Jason using the API, and the the answer you get from the API will also be in in a Jason format. I like Jason. 
Um, I, I, don't, I, I tend to move away from XML a little bit because I, I find it a little bit readable, better readable. I don't know why, but it's just a personal preference. Because we also have XML, uh, and that's more of a markup language that also defines like the, the way it's encoded and, and, and it's a specific format. And they say it's human readable. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm less human. Uh, but so I, my preference is, is JSON. Now, whenever you start working with the API, first thing you need to do is open a, th a session, and that needs authentication. So you create a session ID. Um, if you do that, you, you return, you get like an excerpt of session ID back, and then you, every API call you do, you use that session ID. If you don't do anything for 30 minutes, the session expires, you have to open up a new session. Session timeout is tweakable. But for security reasons, I would leave it at like 30 minutes. By the way, um, I know some of you were, uh, uh, at least from the previous sessions we did the last couple of years, had some questions around API, like how many commands can I send, uh, some benchmarking. We have a guide available right now on myzerto.com that is the scale benchmarking performance guide, <coughs> can't remember the, the entire name, that also has API statistics in there. So how much, like how much API calls can I do per second, those kind of things. So if you're worried about that, you want to look at that, we have a guide available. Now authentication, I'm not going to walk <laughs> through the entire code letter by letter, but this is basically how you do it. Um, got a little bit easier with PowerShell Core right now, so that I, I condensed it to a little bit less code. Um, but you basically take the username and password, you encode it, um, you send it to the API, you get a session back, and you use that session in every other API call you do. Now, what are some of the use cases for automation in Zerto? Um, some of them already have a script available in our um, GitHub with examples, but you could do a mass VRA deploy and upgrade. And actually, we made the VRA upgrade a little bit easier because instead of doing it in the script right now, we have a like a mass deploy API call. Um, you can change all the IP VIP settings at once using a script, so you don't have to type all the VMs. Also, examples available. Um, automated VM protections, there's a couple of scripts available there. One that integrates with VRO, um, one that you just uses vCenter and like folders. Um, so you have a specific folder structure, you place the VM in there and it automatically creates a VPG based on the folder name and the VMs that are underneath that folder will be in that VPG and you can schedule it to run just using a task scheduler. Uh, there's multiple examples available and you can basically change it to whatever you like. Uh, you can create a recovery plan um, for like failover testing, doing failovers, um, making sure the VPG order is correct. Um, put scripts in between, timeouts in between, also available on the thing, on the, on the website, or do custom reporting. So we have a couple of scripts that either send you a health report or an, uh, emails you the unprotected VMs um, or, or, or any changes in that. So there's, there's multiple things that you can do using the automation. There's also multiple APIs available. I'm going to discuss like the most important ones. Um, one of them is the VRA API. This is really all the operations you can do on a VRA. Install, upgrade, delete, um, change the settings. If you need to change IP addresses, um, you can all do that using the API. So we actually have, um, I think, is someone from IBM in the room? Great, so you can't correct me if I'm lying. Um, no, they, they, have, they have Ansible, what they use for automation, and they actually automated um, the creation. So once they add a new ESXi host to a cluster, um, as part of that process, they automatically deploy a VRA on that host. If they need to decommission a host, they automatically remove the VRA from that host. So everything goes in a really orchestrated manner. Some of the scripts we have available, some of the use cases for the VRA API, once again, mass deploy VRA, mass upgrade VRA, or auto install, that's the one that IBM has. Uh, auto install VRA on a new host. 
Um, most of it uh, you could also do with VRO as part of a workflow, um, but that's definitely something a lot of the, the larger organizations are looking at because they want to automate as much as possible to avoid all of those human errors you can have when you're manually installing that VRA on that host. Now, the other VRA is, and this is a more complex one, is the VPG Management API. Um, the VPG Management API allows you to change settings of existing VPGs, allows you to create VPGs. Um, the thing is, the VPGs contain a lot of settings. So basically what you do with the VPG Management API is you get a framework in the JSON format or XML format, a framework of all those settings. You can change those, you can add those, and then you send that JSON code to the API and you can do it for multiple settings or multiple VPGs and then commit those changes. So it's, it's, it's not doing it live. You first send the settings, then you do commit, and then it actually applies it to the VPGs. Um, we've been waiting for this one for a long time. Actually, the good news is we'll have those VPG settings available for ZCAs as well, so Azure, uh, AWS. Um, so you can start creating VPGs for Azure as well. We already have the VCD VMware ones, uh, Hyper-V ones, now we're adding the public cloud ones as well. So some of the things you can do with the VPG Management API, automated VM protection. I do get a lot of questions about automated VM protection. It's always a little bit tricky on how they exactly want to do it and how you need to integrate it. Integrate it. But uh, um, we're also looking at Snow integration, right? Or ServiceNow integration right now, um, and doing some blogs and scripts around that because uh, that seems to pop up more and more and more. Um, but also mass VIP, mass change VIP settings. Um, sometimes people need to change the IP address, change subnets, switch from one data center to the other, um, and this really allows you to just simply change them all in one click. Now we also have a VPG API, but VPG API is more operational. So I can start a failover, start a failover test, and this one is new, move the VPG. Um, so you can also automate like migrations if you're doing that, specifically for like cloud service providers and their onboarding process. You can now automate the move as well. But also things like pause and resume, um, which we use, for example, in um, supporting SQL clusters. Um, so we have a, a script that monitors if a uh, server fills over yes or no, and based on that, we pause and resume different VPGs. Um, but also offsite clone. So who's using offsite clone here? Good. So offsite clone is now, well, it used to be in the script already, but it's, it's definitely something that people tend to forget about. But also, the thing you would never like to do, but delete a VPG. Now with the checkpoints and the status, the thing we have right now is that we can also create a checkpoint based on a VPG. So that means that you can insert your own tag checkpoint and use that, for example, if you want to do freeze the da database for like a consistent point in time and then use the API to create a checkpoint, tag it, and say, okay, I've done a DB consistent checkpoint right now. Again, what can you do with the VR VPG API? Create a recovery plan because it has all the operations in there to do failover tests, failover <coughs> move, you name it. Um, also create customized reporting because every the information is also pulled out of the VPG. So things like RPO statistics. If you don't have you have like security concerns, you don't want to use analytics. You can use this to pull it into your own monitoring system and do some alerting on that. And of course, automated failover testing, something that returns more and more and more, where people actually want to. Um, automatically test it on a Friday afternoon, then get back on Monday, read the reports, it worked wonderful. I didn't have to do anything, but it all worked fine. Now, what did we recently add, and this is actually over the last year, uh, to our product, one of them is a journal file level recovery API. So you can now actually recover a file using the API. Um, which, is, which is pretty cool, and will be more additions to that one. Um, change recovery VRA API. So instead of doing everything manually with VPGs and VPG settings, you can now do it using the API. Evacuate host is actually also an API call. So if you want to use the evacuate host in your maintenance, like recovery or maintenance workflows, you can use that one as well. And the, the change recovery VRA is more like on a per VM based, evacuate host is just for the entire host. 
Um, manual checkpoint creation, so the create attack checkpoint API is something we added. Uh, the recovery report API, so instead of downloading the PDF, you can now pull that information from the API and pull it into your own, I don't know, whatever you use for like reporting or managing uh, uh, those types of information. Uh, and the move VPG, that was something I was waiting for for a long, long time, uh, but we made it. Now with Zero Analytics, it's a little bit different. Um, Zero Analytics uses the Open API standard and uses Swagger. Now, what is Swagger? Um, I created my own acronym. Not sure if it's really easy to use, but it's uh, so what you see is what you have in the API. So Zero Analytics, you simply go to um, docs api.docs.zero.com and it opens up. And you can actually test API calls, see the response, see what's available, see what it needs, the parameters you need to use. Um, so it's basically an automatic documentation system as well. We don't need to update anything, we just update the code and that updates itself so it's available online straight away. Um, and you can do whatever you, whatever is available is in there right now. So one thing we've done with Zerto Analytics, this is just an example, uh, like it was a quick, quick and dirty thing. Uh, we have the RPO stats API call. And basically that gives you like a few statistics of the RPO in, uh, of a specific VPG. So like things like averages, minimum, maximum, and you can do some alerting on that. So there's the multiple monitoring tools out there. I, I used PRTG in this example. So what have I done? I just pulled that information from the API using a script. And you can all find this script on our GitHub again. Um, do it every five minutes and return that in an XML format that the monitoring tool understands. That way we can now integrate with that monitoring tool. This, the output, you can adjust that. Could be for Nagios, could be for any monitoring tool out there, because the data is still the same. So you could output it in different formats. Now, very interesting topic, the hackathon we did last Sunday. Uh, but that's <coughs> what Steve is gonna talk about. Yep, so we had our first hackathon this year. So I can see a few faces, I know Lee's here. Uh, who, who were involved in this. So we just wanted to talk about some of the things that we did in that and um, that might be relevant to your use cases. Um, <clears throat> so Hyes actually worked on uh, one where uh, he, he essentially deployed a SNMP agent on the ZV ZVM which allowed him to then um, start utilizing that for alerts. Um, so we've, we've touched on our alerting already um, today, but um, that's actually got a wide range in um, you know, use um, to, to improve our alerting capability today. So that was very good. Um, didn't quite finish it, but it's because we it's quit still early. Time. We stopped. We stopped. We still had five hours left. <coughs> yeah. Could have finished it. That wasn't my fault. People wanted to watch Game of Thrones. <laughs> and they were all sad afterwards yeah, that they watched it. In so. hindsight, maybe not the best idea. <laughs> Uh, Heise has talked as well about Wes Carroll, uh, one of our uh, SEs. Uh, he's worked on obviously the Zerto API wrapper. Um, he's done some pretty cool integration um, with uh, Azure uh, de development area as well in there. Um, so it all builds from there, makes it a lot easier for you to access. Um, but that's a work in progress, it's a huge project. Um, so he, he, he worked on that. Um, and that's again going to be very exciting going forward. Um, Intelligent recovery site selection. Um, so this is one that Lee had in his actual use case. Um, so we worked on that. Um, essentially, it was about identifying the best site based on a collection of metrics to create a VPG against for, from a target perspective. Um, so we were looking at things like CPU utilization, RAM utilization, and also location. Um, so he, he was able to look at um, you know uh, whether the cluster was in the same rack as the source cluster and therefore rule it out if that was the case so they had uh, rack resilience um, so I was doing a lot of that uh, and then ultimately at the end of that porting that into a create new VPG um, uh, API call um, and then creating it against that target VPG so that was pretty cool uh, and then AWS environment pre-check um, 
So this is uh, something that you can run now, and it actually um, it was done by again one of our uh, SME um, uh, uh, SEs, Alex Schenk. Those of you that know him, um, and he, with this he actually managed to um, create a check that's going to validate um, your AWS configuration is in a, a good place um, for, for Zerto. So checking things like uh, VPC endpoint for S3 so that you're not going to get a huge bill for, for transit over the internet or egress um, for that. So things like that, as well as obviously subnets, users, who's got the right permissions, that sort of thing. So that's pretty comprehensive. And I think at the end, he's actually going to look to have it so that it will automatically deploy your ZCA at the end of it if, if it passes. So again, these, these were all obviously um, pretty interesting. None of them won, unfortunately. Um, so, so the winner was actually uh, Ariel Sanchez. Those of you who um, follow the community probably fairly familiar with Ariel and, and uh, Edgar Sanchez as well. Um, so they've been working before uh, Zerto on V documentation, whereby they use Power CLI to pull out a load of information about your site so that you can go to a, an Excel document and see that and instantly have a good understanding of the deployment. Really, they're focusing on sort of new, new um, employees, IT staff, etc., so they can look at this document and have a really good overview. Um, so they worked on adding Zerto into that. Um, so that, that was pretty cool. Um, and so they won. Um, I don't think either of them are here. No. Nope. Um, so yeah, that was pretty cool. Uh, but I mean, these are just some examples that you can do with that. Um, one of the things that we've, we've talked about is you know, balancing your recovery VRAs and using the, the APIs to do that. There's elements out of um, the, the project Lee worked on that uh, could be utilized for things. Um, we've actually got an example which does it based on VM numbers um, on hosts. Um, Long-term goal is to obviously include that in the product, but right now it's not, so you can do it via the API. Um, <clears throat> and then on that note, I'm going to call forward Matt, who's going to talk about a, a customer scenario. So over to you, Matt. Is this on? Yep. Yep. So, yep. So my name is Matt Bernhardt. I'm an SE for Zerto out on the left coast. I've uh, been here a couple of years, been in the industry for quite a while. What I'm finding when I'm out there, when I'm talking to a lot of folks, is how can they want to know how can they make Zerto do things without actually having auditors or what have you or, or uh, other folks logging into the, the product itself, the GUI itself. So one particular one is a large state agency. Uh, they have a pretty sizable environment. They had some requirements like a lot of folks are getting from the sea level. We got to go to the cloud. We got to go now. So we're, we, they decided to start with DR to Azure, uh, start out with a subset of their VMs, about 250 VMs. And for uh, the testing, what we had to, to prove out was their primary application, the most important application in the environment. It was uh, about 50 VMs, right around 20 terabytes of data at this point. And it's a very uh, picky application in terms of needing a lot of prereqs, a lot of services, a lot of other VMs available before it comes up. Uh, and they needed a solution that was repeatable, that could be done by folks other than their senior level engineers, you know, if it was a failover test, they wanted to allow the test dev folks to do it themselves. If it was an actual event, they wanted to allow the on-call uh, engineer or even the 24-hour staffed ops desk to be able to do it. And again, they didn't want those folks to need to log into Zerto, click some buttons and uh, get it to happen. So what did we do? Uh, you know, we put in what Zerto is known for, which is continuous data replication. So we were able to take care of the RPO, RTO issues, uh, improve those a significant amount. We went ahead and created a couple of networks inside of Azure, one to do a, a non-disruptive test failover, so they're not proving out DR during an actual event. And uh, we went ahead also and used, as they talked about earlier up here, the VPG, not only the orchestration inside the VPG itself to determine which VMs come up first and set up boot delays. But then, because we were made up of uh, roughly 10 VPGs, we needed those to come up in a certain order with delays between them. So we had certain services in place and target VMs in place. So we went ahead and set that up. And then it was, it's being scripted in two different ways. One, for a failover test, 
you know, so that we can go ahead and let, again, the dev team use it to stand up the environment. You know, it's not cheap to run compute in, in uh, public cloud, so we want to stand up that environment, let them do their testing, let them do their validation, and when they're done, go ahead and hit the end button and have it come down. Uh, and if there was a true event, they wanted, again, the easy button, push a single button, bring up the environment, and uh, yeah, that's, that's how we laid it out. Cool, thank you. So we, we've talked about, I guess, the key resources. Um, the GitHub is going to be something that's uh, continually updated, so recommend looking there, even if it's not relevant to your use case. Any of the examples, I guarantee there's elements in those scripts that will be, that you can just pull out and throw into your scripts. So um, there's, there's a wealth of resource there. Um, MyZerto, again, for tech documentation, but also the forums side of things as well. So if you've got questions, we've got people um, from a Zerto perspective, but also customers active on there um, who can answer your questions from um, uh, you know, an API perspective, etc. cetera, within, um, <coughs> within um, uh, the forums there. Um, I would say Hi's obviously talked a bit about the analytics and the capabilities on there. I'd recommend, if that's of interest to you, uh, to go to the session we have on that at the end of the day. It's the graveyard shift, unfortunately, but um, our product manager, Lee's delivering that one, and uh, there's some pretty cool stuff we're doing going forward. Really, I see that as being, you know, when you've got something where it's, it's not a, a bulk create or something where you want it to be a reactive capability, the key for that and, and the decision making is it all going to come out of that analytics. So the information that's going to be available on there is really relevant. Um, so I definitely recommend you guys uh, go to that if you have time. <clears throat> so on that note, is there any questions? One. Yes, absolutely. Um, obviously, it's not there yet, um, but it's on the roadmap. Do we, do we? I think next year is it? Early next so, year? Yeah. So, so right now, the, the the core focus for LTR is the engine, and um, a lot of the APIs are actually already available, but they're not public yet um, because they might change upon like the insights we get over the the next couple of versions. But 8.0 should be the the version. Um, by the way, I say 8.0 might be 7.6, so disclaimer there. Um, it should have all the APIs available, yeah. Any other questions? Um, the recovery reports that you can do um, within the GUI, they produce a nice PDF that looks very computer generated that my compliance team likes. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, that's a great suggestion. Um, I don't think that we've got anything imminently coming around that. Um, so if you haven't raised a feature request, I'd, I'd recommend you put one in via MyZerto. Um, that's the sort of feedback we, we, we like to hear. Obviously, that's been a big gap. So having that as it is now is a, a big step forward. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's going to potentially add complexity as well and things. So it's, it's how you deliver that, I guess, would be the challenge. But yes, good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's, it's an absolute possibility. I recommend putting in the feature request. And yeah, I think actually based on that, there there is a another company that I actually talked to yesterday or the day before that already uses the API. And what they actually do is they generate an email based on the API. Uh, like computer generated, but also add the raw XML or JSON uh, data to that email. And that's that's what their compliance team actually like more because it's it has the source of the information as well. So the, uh, um, I actually have his card, so uh, I could m maybe link the two of you. Yeah. Cool. Anything else? Awesome. <clears throat> so if you could. Uh, if you get a chance, just uh, pop, pop a review in for the session. Um, just let us know your thoughts. really helps with us defining agendas for, for next year and ultimately understand what you guys want to hear when you come into these events. So um, if you get time, pop in a five-star review on here. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>